Good morning, everybody. Happy to open the second day of our conference. I hope you're all rested after a beautiful dinner. I don't know how many of you went for post uh, dinner drinks, so be awake by the time it's time to ask questions. We have here a session on uh, price dispersion and inflation with uh, Francisca from uh, the Federal Reserve Board. We have Gaetano from the Ecole des Institutes de Commerciales in Paris, Hachus in Paris, uh, Henning from the Deutsche Bundesbank, and Slava also from Federal Reserve of Boston. And Gaetano, I hope you feel very safe among all these central bankers. Uh, we start with, uh, you were even one of us, so uh, welcome back. So we start from Francisca, you have 25 minutes. One thing, um, order of the day, we don't end at 11.45 for the posters, but at noon. So just that you know, those of you who have posters, we start at noon with that. Okay, good morning, everyone. And thank you for having me here today. In this paper, so, sorry, how do I, um, where is the paper? This? No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> First, uh, let me just mention that all the views that I will present here today are solely my, my own and um, not the ones from the Federal Reserve Board or the Nielsen IQ, that is the company that provides the data. The key question that I want to address in this paper is what are the welfare effects of steady state inflation? In standard sticky price models, which are the models that I will be addressing today, inflation decreases welfare. You probably know why it is the case, but just to recap, if nominal prices are fixed for any reason, inflation is going to erode real prices. So if we have two identical firms, so firms with the same uh, costs of production, and they change uh, their prices at different times, uh, the real prices are going to be different. So we will have that the relative prices are not going to reflect the relative costs of production. So when we observe a price dispersion, this means that uh, the, uh, the, this price dispersion is not going to be reflecting the relative costs of the firms, and this will be generating inefficiencies. So in these kind of models, there, there is a very tight link between price dispersion and the costs of inflation. And uh, even though the relationship between inflation and price dispersion is crucial for welfare in this type of models, we don't know much about this relationship in the data. What I will do in this paper is first to try to estimate the relationship between price dispersion and inflation. For several reasons that I will talk about later, I will focus in a uh, product level relationships instead of uh, aggregate level relationships. And I am going to uncover a new fact, that is that the relationship between product level price dispersion and inflation has a upsilon shape around zero. What do I mean with this? Well, that around zero product level inflation, price dispersion is going to jump, and then this relationship will become flatter as absolute inflation increases. Now, I, uh, after trying out different off-the-shelf models, I find that these uh, models uh, that I addressed uh, in the beginning of my presentation cannot account for this uh, relationship. So I am going to take one of these models, in particular a menu cost model, and I am going to extend it to account for this relationship uh, between price dispersion and inflation. Uh, and to account for this relationship, I am going to um, assume that consumers want to search for the lowest prices. Uh, so this is the new element that I introduce in my model, and I am also going to provide supporting evidence on uh, shopping behavior that gives us an additional reason to uh, think about consumer search and inflation. 
Finally, I am going to take this uh, product level data. So this uh, relationship that I find at, a, at the product level, and I am going to also take um, a multi-sector version of my model, and I am going to calibrate uh, this um, mo model to uh, study the relationship between welfare and aggregate inflation. And I will find that there are, or there might be benefits of inflation that have been overlooked by previous literature. Let's start with the empirical section. We want to know what is the empirical relationship between um, price dispersion and inflation. The literature and also myself have faced, faced two challenges. The first one is that we want to measure price dispersion resulting solely from nominal rigidity. So we want to uh, control for uh, product heterogeneity, namely size and quality of the products, the location of uh, the stores and date of transactions. To um, overcome this challenge, what I am going to do is to uh, compare the prices of products that have the exact same barcode among uh, sellers that um, have these transactions at the same date. I will talk more about this later. The second challenge is that we have, uh, we, we need sufficient statistical power to identify the relationship. What I mean is that we need, we need enough variation and also enough observations to carry out the estimation. But uh, the sample that I have to compute price dispersion is only for a short uh, sample period, so between 2006 and 2017. Uh, and moreover, aggregate inflation in this period will, was low and stable. So this is not going to allow me to uh, estimate the relationship between price dispersion and inflation. I am going to overcome this challenge by estimating the relationship between product level inflation and price dispersion. Let me tell you a little bit about the data. Um, the data that I use is Nielsen's IQ uh, scanner data for the US retail. And I already said that uh, the period is between 2006 and 2017. So in this uh, data set, what we can observe is weekly prices at the barcode level. This means that we can observe the price of a two liter bottle of uh, Diet Coke. Um, and we can observe around 3 million uh, barcode level items that can be classified into a thousand categories. For example, carbonated beverages in the case of Diet Coke. And these uh, 3 million barcodes uh, are sold by over 35,000 stores uh, in more than 200 metropolitan statistical areas in the US. And an example would be the Whole Foods store in Hyde Park, Chicago. So just to um, pin down ideas, what I am going to do is to take the prices of Diet Coke, that uh, this is going to be the item indexed by K, across all the stores in uh, Chicago, which is going to be the metropolitan statistical area indexed by M, at a particular week, indexed by T. So I will take the set of stores selling uh, the exact same item at the same date, and within this set of stores, I am going to, co to compute price dispersion as the standard deviation of the log prices, and I am going to uh, denote this by sigma, sub KMT. And then within the same set, I am going to compute the average price change, which I am going to, com uh, to uh, call product level inflation. And this will be denoted by PKMT. Uh, so since I have all these weekly measures, but I am interested in a comparative statics exercise, I am going to take annual averages of these measures. So I will end up with um, 
this series of price dispersion and product annual inflation, uh, product level inflation, sorry, at the annual level for a set of products and um, metropolitan statistical areas. The next thing that I do is to simply take all these observations and uh, compute this bin scatter plot. What this means is that I just take all the observations uh, of product level inflation at the product uh, um, MSA and annual level, and I divide them into 100 equally sized bins. Then for each bin that you can see on the x-axis, I am going to uh, compute average price dispersion. And this is each dot that you observe in this figure. What you can see is that around zero product level uh, inflation, price dispersion is going to jump, and then it will become flatter as absolute inflation increases. And this is why I called uh, this pattern as the upsilon shape. As a robust nest, what I do is to, uh, well, one of the robust nest exercises that I carry out is to control for several sources of heterogeneity uh, among products and also metropolitan statistical areas simply by adding uh, product year fixed effects and uh, MSA year fixed effects. And even after controlling for all these sources of heterogeneity, you still get this pattern in the data. So um, I carried out several um, robustness checks and the figure is still there. So as I mentioned in the beginning, um, I, I tried to explain this pattern with several of the shelf models and what you would find in these models is that the relationship is flat around zero and then it becomes increasing as absolute inflation increases. So in the models that we typically use, this relationship looks U-shaped instead of Y-shaped. So uh, this is the reason why I wrote a model, because I wanted to explain this pattern using an extension of uh, a uh, standard city price model, in particular, in this case, a menu cost model. So I am not going to show you the details of the model today. I will just explain uh, in a very general level the ingredients of the model and how it works. So in uh, this model, um, I, I just start uh, working at the product level because that is how I, uh, I th that, 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 those are the units in my data. So I, I will uh, show you how everything works at the product level. And in the end, I will talk about how we can aggregate all the, the product level markets to say something about aggregate inflation. So at the product level market, there is going to be a continuum of heterogeneous retailers selling an homogeneous product K. And there is also be, will be a continuum of heterogeneous shoppers searching a retailer to purchase the product K. So going back to Diet Coke, we will have a continuum of shoppers that want to purchase Diet Coke. And there is also a continuum of sellers that have Diet Coke. So the shoppers, each one of them are interested in uh, purchasing um, Diet Coke from only one of the retailers. Okay, so let's start with um, the retailer's price strategies. So the first block there uh, on your left. So this is pretty much the same as a standard menu cost model. We will have that the retailers uh, set nominal prices and to adjust, they have to pay a menu cost. They will also uh, face idiosyncratic menu cost shocks and product level inflation. So these are the two reasons why these retailers would pay the menu cost and adjust. So nothing new there for the moment. 
after we aggregate the uh, the retailers' price strategies, that is um, that is going to give us the real price distribution that I am going to denote by f of k. So this uh, real price distribution is what the shoppers are going to take into account when they compute their optimal search strategies. So from the point of view of the shoppers, they want to purchase Diet Coke, and they know that there is a continuum of retailers out there, but they don't know the prices that each retailer is charging. The only thing that they know is that the real price distribution has a particular shape. In this case, they know the shape of FK of P. So I am going to assume that um, shoppers can search sequentially for the lowest price. This means that they are going to start with a particular draw of this distribution, and depending on their search cost that is heterogeneous, they can decide whether to keep that price draw that can simply be the price that the store crossing the street is charging, uh, or they can continue searching. So what we will have is that there are some shoppers that have a very low search cost, so they will continue searching and searching on, until they find a um, very, very low uh, offer. So um, these uh, shoppers are going to accept an offer if it's lower than the reservation price. And there are uh, other shoppers that have a very high search cost that uh, might be willing to accept a very, very high offer. So in the end, we will have a distribution of search cost that is going to determine the distribution of the reservation price. And this will mean that shoppers who will be willing to accept different offers depending on the level of the search cost. Sorry, okay. Now, we will have the distribution of reservation prices given by the distribution of search costs. So um, we can aggregate the optimal search strategies of all of these shoppers, and that is going to give us a demand function that is going to um, depend on the optimal search strategies of the, of the shoppers. Um, so, then uh, this demand function will affect the profit function, and both of them will be affected by the uh, search strategies, which in turn will be uh, affected by the real price distribution, which in turn is going to be affected by inflation. So the only way in which inflation uh, affects uh, the optimal search strategies and also the demand function is through uh, price distribution. And um, well, finally, this demand function is going to uh, affect the retailer price strategies, closing the, the circle. Now I will uh, explain you the overall intuition about why this model reproduces uh, this Upsilon uh, shape relationship between price dispersion and product level inflation. So, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, search cost is going to be um, heterogeneous and is going to range between gamma lower bar and gamma upper bar meaning that the consumers that have a very low search cost, this is gamma lower bar, are the ones that are going to search the most and we have the lowest reservation price. So now uh, let's go to the case in which zero, uh, a product level inflation is equal to zero. So we want to understand why in the data we, we would observe uh, a very low point uh, in the relationship between product level inflation and price dispersion before it becomes very steep as absolute inflation increases. So in an equilibrium with zero product level inflation, search is not going to be profitable for shoppers that have a search cost that is very, very high. 
So the ones that are going to be searching are the shoppers that have a, a very low search cost. These shoppers that have a low search cost will all have a, a reservation price that is very similar and that I am going to denote by RK of gamma lower bar. So these shoppers that have a, a very low search cost and that are a relatively uh, high density in the market will uh, shop, will search until they find a very, very low uh, price offer. Now, the retailers that are very productive um, internalize that these shoppers will be searching until they find this particular price. So if I am a very productive retailer, I will be charging this very low um, price only to serve searchers. Because if I set a slightly higher price, I am going to um, lose all of these customers that are only willing to pay a low price. And if I set a price that is slightly lower, I am not going to be attracting more, uh, more shoppers. Yes. Ah, 10 minutes, okay, I thought you had a, a question. Five, okay, okay. Um, then we will have that, um, all the productive retailers bunch around this uh, very low reservation price that is we observe in this real price distribution plot. And this is what generates uh, low price dispersion around uh, zero product level inflation. Then suppose we increase uh, product level inflation by a little bit, just by an epsilon. In the previous case, we had zero product level inflation. So real prices were equal to nominal prices. But now that we have inflation, our real prices will be eroding every period. So if the retailers wanted to uh, stay, char they wanted to keep charging this very low uh, reservation price, this very low price equal to the reservation price, they would have to pay the menu cost every period. So the, um, the retailers only to save on menu cost, they allow uh, low prices. And this is going to increase price dispersion. So in this plot, what you can see is that uh, the, the blue bars represent the equilibrium at zero product level inflation. And the red bars are the uh, same equilibrium but when we only allow retailers to uh, re-optimize as inflation increases. So when uh, search behavior stays fixed at zero, but inflation increases a little bit, we will, we will observe that price dispersion also increases a bit. Now, if we, only, if we also allow uh, shoppers to re-optimize, we will observe that this little bit of price dispersion arising for, from a, a little bit higher inflation is also going to increase the incentives to search for lower prices. So what happens in this case is that um, there is also feedback to the um, behavior of the more productive retailers because they see that some consumers are searching more and some retailers, especially the more productive, will have more incentives to decrease their prices and attract more searchers. And this is why we observe that the uh, lower end of this distribution is also uh, expanding. Uh, but on the other hand, we will have that the least productive retailers, which are mostly serving non-searchers, don't have incentives to decrease their prices. So um, as the price gap by productivity increases, inflation is going to increase a lot. And this is why we observe a jump around zero product level inflation. Now, just to mention very quickly that what I do when I have this model is just to calibrate it uh, to match this Upsilon shape uh, pattern, also the frequency and the size of price changes as in the rest of the literature. And then I compare my model with uh, two models. So the Golosov and Lucas model that in both figures is the blue line. And then the Venamu model that is my model 
but uh, without idiosyncratic shocks. So the left-hand side figure shows a relationship between product level inflation and price dispersion, and the right-hand side figure shows a relationship between absolute uh, size of price changes and product level inflation. And the, the dots in each figure shows data. So the main takeaway is that uh, my figure is the, my, sorry, my model is the only one uh, able to reproduce the relationship between price inflation and uh, product level inflation and price dispersion and also other relationships that can be matched by other models. And um, well, finally, let me mention very quickly, there is also shopping behavior evidence supporting this, uh, the mechanism in this model. So a prediction of my model is that shop, shoppers that are searching more, so shoppers that visit more retailers are going to pay the lowest prices in the market, and this is going to be uh, uh, a, a stronger uh, mechanism when absolute uh, inflation at the product level is higher. So uh, I go to the consumer panel data of Nielsen, that is the sister data set of the, um, of the one that I use to compute the, the Upsilon shape. And I, uh, what I put in the x-axis is the number of distinct retailers that a household visited. And on the y-axis, the uh, log, log of the relative price that the household paid for a particular bundle. So the blue line, shows that the more uh, distinct retailers you visit, the lower are the prices that you pay. And this relationship is going to be steeper as absolute uh, product level inflation increases. And when I take simulated data from my model and plot the same relationship, you can see that uh, the data matches, the, the model matches the data, even though I didn't target this relationship. Um, and just to final, finalize, um, well, as uh, policymakers, we care about aggregate inflation. So aggregate inflation in this case is going to be the average of uh, product level inflation uh, in this economy. And that can be decomposed into a common component that is in this case going to be the rate at which wages increases uh, minus the average of uh, uh, the rate at which uh, sectoral components increase. And I am going to take that from the data. So I will have in uh, this exercise in which I vary only the common component that as inflation increases, the average adjustment cost increase and also the resources that consumers spend on search increase. But there is also a benefit of inflation and that is that search increases competition. So uh, in this case, market concentration increases and also the average markup decreases. So if we compare my model with other models that miss the Upsilon shape uh, relationship, we will find that my model predicts that welfare is maximized at a positive rate of inflation, while the other models uh, predict that uh, welfare is maximized at zero inflation. And that is everything that I have for you today. Okay. So first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I mean, it's been great pleasure to to read this paper. Um, that I think is a is really a fantastic paper. So what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about uh, where um, this literature is and why it's so important for monetary uh, economies. So this literature has noble tradition and dates back to uh, Bart de Jad, among others, and uh, emphasize that the presence of search costs produce market power in the, in the economy. Then in the 90s, there were like uh, models trying to understand how consumer search and uh, firm's price friction will deliver uh, um, some realistic business cycle uh, facts. And they emphasize that among them, Benabu is one of the leaders of this literature. They emphasize that more inflation volatility can be good. Why? Because it generates price dispersion that incentivizes search 
that decrease the market power. So it has a good effect on, on, the, on the markups. That is the other way around uh, reason for which we usually think inflation is bad. Um, so uh, Francisca's paper contributes to this uh, line of literature by providing three main contribution. Uh, I mean, this is the way I see it. So the first is provide convincing evidence, robust evidence, I could not find a better uh, qualifier, that price dispersion is upsilon shaped the inflation. So the introduction of upsilon is also like a contribution, I, I guess, at the item level, okay? So when you think about the picture that she has shown, each point uh, is an item. So it's a market uh, for one item, okay? So annual inflation is annual inflation on the item level. It's not aggregate inflation. This will be important for something I will say later. And then builds a model of search and menu cost and firms heterogeneity that replicates the fat. And the contribution is on stressing how important is firms heterogeneity. And then, among others, there is something that attracts my attention is that inflation, she shows inflation as also bad welfare effects. So she emphasized the good welfare effect, but the, the picture is U-shaped. It comes back and there is like uh, this effect that if there are more people that search, there are some that stay with the, with the firms are the ones that are less elastic. So for them, the markup increase, and this is a welfare loss, okay? This was absent in other, in other papers. Okay, let me try to give you a summary of the mechanism uh, as I see it. So uh, suppose there is a guy that can have consumption of price pH, and there are um, firms that produce the, 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 the same good with different productivity. And this guy has a search cost, so he's going to accept only prices that are below that, otherwise he's going to consume this. So what is happening, that the optimal pricing is to price exactly at the reservation price, and, uh, uh, and there will be no dispersion in prices in this case. Uh, so the heterogeneity in productivity is shut down by this kind of search mechanism. So you have heterogeneity markups, but not any longer in prices, okay? So imagine that there is another guy that has different search costs. Still, this can be optimal if, uh, if uh, it's more important to try to attract two people than try to make a larger markup on one of these guys. And this is one of the feature of, of the model, okay? So there is no price dispersion because this heterogeneity in productivity vanishes through this, this mechanism. And now, uh, I want to introduce menu costs. So suppose that you have to fix the price one period, and then there is a second period in which you cannot move the price, okay? Extreme menu cost, infinite menu cost, okay? And there is inflation. So what happens with inflation is that if you fix the price here, then inflation is going to move your price, your real price here, right, in this region. And this can be good for the green uh, firm, but it's not any longer good for the red one because it deteriorates so much, it goes below the cost, okay? So now the firm have to think again, what will be the optimal price in the first period? And actually the red now may have an incentive to put a higher price because inflation then will deteriorate the price, but still it will be able to attract one guy. And so you see heterogeneity matters again and shows up in prices through inflation, okay? And it matters not only the heterogeneity of productivity, but also the heterogeneity on the, on the consumer uh, side. So this is how inflation generate dispersion in a case in which without inflation, you will, have, you will have zero deflation, okay? And then if you understand this mechanism, you also understand that if you reverse the, the inflation direction, then it's completely symmetric. So this is where the model is able to explain this symmetric behavior, okay? So this is my, recollection of the mechanism and how is able to match the data. Uh, but I want to do a, a further step. So there is another reason why we should care about consumer search. So there is a more recent literature that has showed that you can think about consumer search as a micro foundation for why firms are sticking their price. Why? Because if people run away from you, Maybe you don't want to raise the price, you want to retain your customer. And so this is a micro foundation for price rigidity. So in one of my recent work, I'm thinking about something else, that uh, consumer search can be a micro foundation for paid price rigidities. That is, suppose that the firms are completely elastic, okay? But it's your action of searching for a lower markup that makes the price that you pay less rigid 
with the, with the inflationary shock, okay? So price go up 1%, but when you are hit by this, you put more effort and search for something lower markup. And so this is how you, the price that you pay doesn't increase 1%, even if they are posting 1% more, okay? So why I think that this is important and deserve attention? Because when we talk about New Canadian Phillips curve, all these things, so we have in mind uh, posted price inflation. Why? Because we refer to the New Canadian typically in which there is no difference between posted and paid price inflation, okay? In fact, what matters is the paid price inflation, but in the New Canadian there is no difference. And uh, what I want to, and, and then this is why we, we pay so much attention on pricing, okay? But there is another half of the world in which there are households that choose where to go that is equally interesting. And uh, what, what, I, uh, what my, my interest in reading this paper is trying to understand how this model may enrich my view about this difference between paid and post prices, okay? So let me explain you why in the New Canadian we have no difference, okay? So here in this graph, you have paid inflation, posted inflation. So suppose there is some posted inflation. So firms raise 1% your, uh, the, the price. But if you are, um, if you are uh, attached to a firm that is raising the price, so it's optimized, you have an incentive to shift to the sticky prices, right? So then the, 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 the paid price is lower than the post price. What happens with deflation? When uh, you are attached to a firm that is not revising your price, then you have an incentive to go to the flexible ones. So you are still lower. Okay, so posted paid prices is lower than posted prices. So this is the relation in the New Canadian. And in the first order, approximation is equal. This is why we don't care about what households do. Okay, but you can have a different story. What is the different story? The different story is that uh, when people buy stuff, they don't know what are the other prices. Okay, so I see my price going up, the price of the... Uh, shop in the neighborhood going up. I don't know if this is local or global, but I give a chance that this is local. So my relative price is getting worse. And this makes me search. So if inflation goes up, in posted inflation, I search more and my paid inflation goes down, as in the New Canadian. But the thing is different when we go on the other side. When there is negative inflation, then I I give a chance to the price, to my relative price, to be better. And so I have less incentive to search. I'm more willing to stay. And so the paid price may be higher than the, 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 the posted price, okay? I experience less deflation. And so this is a model in which you can have that paid price inflation is different from posted even at the first order, okay? And this is the effect of search. Uh, in the paper, we show with IRI data that 1% posted inflation uh, equals to 0 0.3 uh, paid inflation. So this relation exists in the data. And this is just to advertise that I, I, I have a, a ERC consolidator grant that is going to build on this. This is one of the legs. So apart from advertising this, uh, why I, I, I introduced this discussion, because I thought, oh, but we have a model of search incentives. So I want to think about the same picture with the model of Francisca, okay. So the first thing is search incentive are symmetric, as in the New Canadian case. So I was expecting, maybe this evidence will point me out that New Canadian is the right one, but it's discontinuous. So first of all, I don't know what happens in first order uh, terms. But then I also realized that this is not so simple because the distribution of posted changes with the, with the realization. So in practice, one of the advantage of the model is that the distribution of posted is a function of the shock. And the shock is also moving the distribution of the pay, okay, how people choose to move. And so it's a very complicated thing and actually, I, I would suggest to explore this because there, is, there could be a contribution in that, in that dimension, okay? But then thinking a bit more, I also realized that, wait a moment, it's not obvious that uh, search incentives are uh, symmetric in this model, in the sense like they push me 
to the new Keynesian case. And I show you this picture is the last thing that I'm going to show to, to motivate that. So this is a picture for the, for the European data showing the dispersion of inflation at the item level. Okay, so for each period, you have the dispersion at the item level. And you can see that as the average increase, so more inflation means also more cross-sectional dispersion across items, okay? So it means that if my incentive to search is inflation, it means also that uh, Francisca will find in the data that I'm searching more at the item, item level when the, this, this, at the item level I have much more dispersed inflation rates, okay? So this is a very interesting relation that I think deserves more uh, investigation. And I think Francisca has something in the model that can explain that because um, if you interpret different varieties of different items, yes, you have that. Okay, so my recollection of, of the paper, I think this is a fantastic paper. It's really, I mean, very interesting for me, so I, I never uh, thank uh, uh, enough for uh, putting me in here. I think uh, it's a fantastic quantitative micro data paper. What still I don't see very well is how aggregate inflation can feed back, especially for the fact that people search for bundle of goods, doesn't search for each item separately. And so I think this is the, maybe the margin of improvement uh, for, the, for the research. Thanks, sorry for taking long. Thank you, Gaetan. We still have five minutes for discussion. Are there questions from the audience before Francisca gets a chance to answer also to the... Yeah, Peter. Thank you, Peter Corradi from uh, ECB. So, so one question is, is in the data, uh, we see a lot of sales, which is kind of these temporary cuts, which are kind of, it's a, and, and, uh, and there are models with kind of dynamic pricing when, when, uh, when firms are kind of using this, this kind of dynamic discrimination. So have, have searchers kind of come for the search price and, and try to get uh, others who are kind of not searchers kind of keep paying the, the high price. And, and, and basically my question is, is how do you kind of first treat in the data this, this kind of behavior? I guess you don't have this in, in your model. And, and the other is, is how, how do you think this kind of mechanism would change some of your conclusions? So if you kind of take, take this kind of possibility of firms into account. Thanks. Okay, so first, uh... Let me thank uh, Gaetano for the discussion, most of what we uh, discussed in dinner yesterday. So um, I do think that it is relevant to introduce consumer search in inflation models, especially for central banking, because uh, we do observe that, so as I, I just show you, that as inflation increases, we have consumers searching for the lowest prices as, um, and as Gaetano um, noted, there might be differences between how um, posted and uh, effective price inflation react to the, to the uh, business cycles. So uh, consumer search might have a crucial role in this. So of course, um, I, take his comments and I do think that um, we should continue doing more research into these areas. Um, then to address Peter's question. So um, the first step that I took to address that question was to um, filter my data to remove all the temporary price cuts. So this data has no, doesn't have sales flags. So you have to make several assumptions um, in order to remove sales. So um, I started applying sales filters that are uh, typically uh, algorithms that allow you to remove uh, B-shaped uh, patterns in the price uh, series. And 
there are also filters um, that take uh, a reference price uh, from the price series. So I thought that it would be very hard to do it, but it was um, easier than I thought. So it took me a month instead of, you know, like six months. And um, what I find is that after removing these temporary price cuts and focusing on series that show you regular prices, you still have this pattern. In fact, um, in a, a newer version of the paper that I am working on, I am just focusing on regular prices since I don't have any sales in my model. Um, and the overall conclusions don't change. Um, and then regarding sales, I think that that is also a very interesting mechanism that could be added in the paper because I so the way in which they fit into my model is that by charging low prices, you know, the, the retailers are attracting more searchers. So I don't think that the main mechanism would change much. Uh, you would still have this micro price setting behavior that in the end would have uh, aggregate implications. Um, but of course, if you were to think of sales as um, a mechanism that retailers use just to, um, to just on the retailer side without any consequence on the uh, consumer side. So if you do not include consumer search, I mean, you would be reaching the same conclusions as the previous literature. Right, so we have no question from Webex, so maybe now Hennington can bring us to the other side of the moon on the heterogeneity of productivity and firms. Good. Um, so I really enjoy the conference, I have to say, and that is uh, thanks to a number of people. So that is Sarah, Ina, Elena, Peter, Edward, Michele, it's also Jean-Paul, Chiara, Mathieu, and Richard. Okay, thanks to all of you. Good. Now, uh, to confuse you a bit more, uh, I have two co-authors. Uh, this is Klaus Adam, from, uh, University of Mannheim, and uh, Andre Alexandrov uh, from Rome. And uh, there's a disclaimer, uh, that's the usual one. Uh, so this paper is about inflation distorts relative prices. So this is our main finding. And I'm gonna take you through a little bit of theory and evidence. Now, in case uh, you missed Francesca's introduction, I'm using the same. Uh, so there are monetary models uh, and these monetary models have a feature uh, so, so quite many of them have this feature, and that is that inflation distorts relative prices if nominal prices are sticky. So how does it work? Suppose you are a firm and an, uh, operating in a high inflation environment. Now you set your price, you know that price is going to stay for some time, and you know that inflation is going to erode that price over time. So you understand this, and you know there's a target price that you want to hit, so you're going to set your price above the target price initially, understanding that in expectations, you're gonna end below the target price eventually, okay? Now, that gives uh, inefficient drifts in relative prices during these non-adjustment periods. And these drifts generate uh, inefficient fluctuation in relative prices, right? And those inefficient fluctuations, they generate misallocation and that, that is uh, where things get uh, uh, not so nice, right? Now, this mechanism, uh, which is in many of these models, is also key for many of the well-known predictions of these models. And I put just two here. So permanently high inflation reduces economic welfare. And another one would be low and stable inflation is desirable, right? You've, you've seen these uh, predictions uh, frequently. Now, 
Now, as Francesca emphasized, uh, as I'm also emphasizing, structural evidence supporting this mechanism is uh, largely absent, and the emphasis here is on structural. Now, um, why is this? There is a relatively straightforward reason for this. Uh, so, identification of price distortions, in fact, is difficult. Now, look at this decomposition over there, which has the observed relative price. So, that's the sticky price that the firm sets. And you can decompose it in the flexible relative price. So that's the that's the price that the firm would like to set, ups and pricing frictions, plus the price gap, which is just the gap between the sticky and the flex price. Uh, and that price gap is the distortion, uh, which depends on inflation, idiosyncratic shocks, the degree of suboptimality of inflation, what have you, right? Now, the thing is, we don't observe this flexible relative price. That's a counterfactual price, right? We don't see that. And hence, we don't see the price gap. Now, that's that's a problem because that's the object that depends on inflation and that we would like to know, right? So uh, then uh, we would like to know, say, the price gap, ideally directly or moments of the distribution of the price gap, um, but we don't see it. So price distortions generally are not identified if we just uh, observe the sticky relative prices alone. Okay, that's that's the problem. And of course, you could, you could adopt special assumptions like the, the flexible price follows a random walk, or you suppo suppose you have uh, quite informative data about uh, this flexible price. Uh, then, of course, you could overcome that problem, but this in general is not, uh, is not what, we, uh, what we have. Now, the insight that we explored in this paper is that, in fact, we don't have to directly identify the price distortions if we want to test whether or not inflation distorts relative prices, you know, this main mechanism that is there in the theories. The only thing that we need to identify is the marginal effect of inflation on these price distortions. And that's something different. And it turns out that this can be done and we show how we do this in this paper. Now, we derive a structural empirical approach. So we go back to the theories uh, and derive our estimation equations directly from the theories to estimate exactly this marginal effect, right? And it turns out that the approach that we're gonna derive uh, works for both time and state dependent pricing frictions. So this paper is really not about whether one of the other, one or the other is more plausible in light of the micro data because the mechanism is in both of these uh, types of models and uh, that's what we are interested in to see whether the mechanism is really there. Now, once we have this empirical approach, we're gonna implement it using the um, UK microprice data, uh, which you can find on the website of the Office of National Statistics. So three main findings. Uh, in the cross-section of products, uh, suboptimal inflation, and I have to explain to you how we get to the suboptimal part of inflation, is strongly associated with price distortions. Uh, so that is confirming that this mechanism is there in the data. Now, in the aggregate UK economy, um, going from the product to the aggregate level, these price distortions happen to co-vary with uh, aggregate inflation, which is a prediction of very basic models, and that prediction is going to be borne out in our data also. However, most ob observed price uh, dispersion, so remember my, my little decomposition, that's dispersion of the left-hand side, the observed price, in fact, is unrelated to price distortions, okay? And the reason is pretty simple. This flex price is just so variable that it's going to dominate most of, the, most of the observed price dispersion, okay? Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you this, even though we cannot directly identify price distortions, okay? Good. Now, here's a little preview about uh, the um, empirical approach. It's a two-stage approach, and we're going to go and uh, start out with uh, detrending the relative price of an individual product. And here we have to be careful. Now, my labeling here or my word use is different than Francesca's. So product for me is a physical good at a particular place. Okay, It could, it could also be a service. But the point is, it's not a UPC, a barcode that you can buy at different stores or at different regions. It's really a barcode in a store, okay? So it's a finer definition of a product. Now, we take this product, and we're going to follow it over the lifetime of this product. And uh, we see the relative price of that product. And that relative price over the lifetime, we're going to detrend. This gives us a residual, and uh, we compute the variance of this residual, so residual dispersion. 
That's the first stage. Now, in the second stage, we take this variance for different type of products and generate a cross-section. And then we're going to relate that cross-section to product-specific measures of suboptimal insulation. Okay. Now, we do the regression, we get a coefficient, and that coefficient is the object of interest. That's the marginal effect of suboptimal inflation on price dispersion. And I show you here that the marginal effect that we estimate, so you see the distributions of this coefficient, that is quite positive. So we estimate this coefficient in uh, each of the thousand, um, roughly a thousand uh, expenditure items. So an item would be a collection of similar products in each of these items in the UK CPI. And uh, that's the distribution we get. It's fairly positive and fairly significant also. Good, now related literature, uh, let, let me reiterate. So what we do is uh, go back to the theories and derive our estimation equations directly there. And these equations suggest that we look at a very specific type of price dispersion measure, namely the one over the product life cycle. And that uh, you should relate to the product's suboptimal inflation rate. Now, what existing work has done is something a bit different. Uh, existing work had, has looked at, at a given point in time, at the cross-sectional dispersion in prices across different products, okay? That's also what Francesca did. And then uh, existing work took this measure of price dispersion and related it to actual inflation. So we would relate it to suboptimal inflation. Um, so with this, uh, let's let's jump into the general setup. It's relatively simple. Aggregate consumption is conductless uh, composite of item level consumption. Item level consumption is uh, a CES composite of all products in the item. Um, now that that uh, demand structure is just to replicate our data structure. Now a product in an item, as I said, is really a physical good. It could be a service also in a particular location. Okay. Same degree of price rigidity for all the products in the item, and you could have product turnover in the item. Now, um, how about the pricing? We use a quadratic approximation of the firm objective. So firm J, which produces product J and item Z, is going to set the price to minimize the period loss function over the expected price spell. And that loss function is, in fact, uh, quite, uh, quite simple. It's just the squared deviation between the, the sticky price of the firm relative to the item level price level, so that's the PJ over the PZ, minus the flex price, that's the P star, right? And the, the only interesting object here is really the flex price. So let's, let's look at this. Now, we, we assume this flex price has three components. Um, now, the first one is blue, so that's a product fixed effect uh, that is drawn from some arbitrary distribution at the time when the product enters the market. And it could be a lot of stuff. It could be on un unobserved quality, service, marginal cost markup, all the stuff that's kind of constant over the product life cycle, but specific to the product and location of that product. Now, the second component, that's the red one, that's a product specific trend. Again, it's drawn upon entry of the product. And that's a marginal cost trend in terms of structural, uh, uh, structural bits. Uh, so you could think the, the, the firm comes into the market, starts producing its, its product, and, but gets more, pro, more productive in the course of time uh, of producing that product. So it learns how to produce that product better. And that gives a trend in the marginal cost of the product. Now, it turns out that, that this trend is, in fact, the optimal inflation rate of this specific product. And it's quite easy. Suppose this trend is 2%. Now, the firm sets its price at some point, its sticky price. Now its flex price is going to decline over time, right? So ideally, its sticky relative price also should decline at the same rate. Now, if the flex price trend is 2%, you want to have the price level also trending up uh, at 2% because uh, that's going to reduce the, the sticky relative price of the firm. Okay, that's the sense in which uh, this trend here is uh, really capturing the optimal inflation rate for this specific, uh, particular product. Now, the last component of this uh, dynamic, uh, this flexible price is uh, the idiosyncratic shocks. And again, this could be cost productivity or demand shocks. We don't really take a stand here. The important thing is that these shocks come from a stationary process, which is the same uh, for all the products in the item. 
right? So realizations of the pro uh, process, of course, are different across the products, but the process, the process itself is really the same for all the products. Now, before I really jump into the uh, empirical approach, let me be very clear about uh, how we achieve identification. And there are two things to this, the identifying assumptions and the identifying variation. Now, the identifying assumptions, I told you already, right? So we're going to assume that products face the same degree of price rigidity in the item, and they have the same process for idiosyncratic shocks. Now, of course, to satisfy this, we cannot look at the entire economy at once at all the product, but instead we really implement this empirical approach separately for the expenditure items, for each of the expenditure items that we see. Now, the, identifi sorry, the identifying variation that we used, that is really variation across products in the product-specific optimal inflation rate. Okay, so that's, that's variation in the trend that is specific to the flex price of the product. Now, this means that we do not exploit time series variation in actual inflation. So in inflation at the item level or inflation in the, uh, at the aggregate economy level. And the reason is that b both of these variables are relatively stable in our sample and uh, that's, that's not going to give a lot of identifying variation. Now with this, Let's look at, the, at a little example in order to illustrate what, in fact, we do. Um, sorry, I, I just uh, stopped my time. <laughs> um, now, this example uh, has a deterministic flex price to keep uh, things simple. And of course, that's a special case in which uh, the idiosyncratic shock process is the same for all the products. It has the same price adjustment calvo probability for all the products in the item. So that's uh, uh, one minus alpha. And then it has the item level inflation rate, that's the pi z, uh, being positive, say 2%, to keep it uh, specific. And importantly, it's going to be constant over time. Okay. Now, then you see the figure over there, two things are there, the sticky relative price, that's the gray line, and the flexible relative price, that's the um, blue dotted line. And uh, we follow a specific product, product one, over time. And you see that these two things perfectly overlay which tells you that uh, the 2% is in fact optimal for the product one, okay? So the relative price trend of that product is exactly equal to the inflation rate in the item. Now that's, that's kind of a nice case. Let's look at product two. Now for product two, it turns out that the flex price trend is steeper than the inflation rate. So the product, uh, the firm sets the price knowing that this price is eroded too slowly relative to what the flex price of, of the firm is doing. So the firm starts below the flex price, knowing it's ending up in expectation above the flex price uh, at the point in time when it can change the price again. Now, there is now a gap between the flex and the sticky price, and that gap is the price distortions we're going to be interested in. Okay. Now look at uh, product two prime uh, to just see that this is a symmetric argument. Now inflation is too high because the flex price trend is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, again, you get the price distortions, but instead of starting below the flex price, the firm is now going to start above the flex price. Okay. But apart from this, it's, it's fully symmetric. Now let's look at product three here. That's a situation in which the flex price is even steeper so the inflation rate in the item is even more suboptimal. And of course, what's going to result is more price distortions. Okay. Now you take uh, the, the uh, mechanics of all the products together, you get the equation down there that says that the variance of the residual that you get after detrending the, flex, the, the flexible sticky price, so that's the gray lines, that's our data, after detrending this data, uh, we can compute the variance of the residual variance of U, and that's going to be related to the product specific measure of suboptimal inflation, pi minus pi star squared, because this is a symmetric argument. And then that's going to depend on the coefficient C. That's the marginal effect we are interested in. Okay. And in the theory, this marginal effect is just driven by the degree of stickiness in the economy. Now, this, of course, was a simple example without the shocks, so let's get a bit more serious here, adding shocks. The first stage is still the same. We're going to detrend uh, uh, the, the sticky relative price of the firm, 
And uh, uh, that is going to give us an estimate for the A, that's the, the intercept coefficient, and an estimate for the B, that's the slope coefficient. Now we can show in the theory that uh, these two things converge to um, the respective moments in the flex price, right? So the A converges to the P star, and the B converges to our product level optimal inflation rate, which is what gives us an estimate of that object. Now then we go into the second stage. As I said, we take the variance of the residual from the first stage, uh, put this together for many different products, which gives us a cross-section, and then we're going to relate this in a linear fashion to um, the suboptimal measure squared of inflation. Uh, we get our marginal, uh, marginal effect, that's the C again, of suboptimal inflation on price distortions. And now, because we have idiosyncratic shocks, we also get this constant V. Now, this constant V captures two things, elements from the flex price and elements from the sticky price economy. Okay, so that's the identification problem. These two things we cannot tell apart, but luckily, these two things do not depend on the degree of suboptimality and in inflation. Okay, so it's fine, we still get our marginal effect, but we, I mean, we as everybody else in the literature are subject to the, the identification difficulty that we cannot tell apart the sticky and the flex price elements in the constant. Now, I said uh, this works for both Calvo and uh, menu costs. So for Calvo, the coefficient we looked at already, for menu costs, so that is a continuous time result. That is one over um, the adjustment frequency squared, the coefficient, the marginal effect. And um, uh, importantly, in the menu cost model, the second stage holds approximately to the second order, right? So this is to say that more stuff is going on in the menu cost model, but to second order, our second stage is going to be vetted. Um, now, it is true that our estimate of the marginal effect is going to be biased towards zero in small, sample, in, in small samples, and this is because of uh, estimation error. Uh, we make this argument in the paper. I'm not going to go through this here. Now, with this um, look at the theory, let's look at the evidence. Uh, I told you about the data. It's the official UK microprice data. Um, so uh, we prepare it a little bit, we get rid of sales, uh, but our results are robust to including them. Um, so we have about 800 uh, products in the uh, average typical item, and we have about 15,000 price quotes in the average item. Uh, and we have about 1,000 expenditure items, so we get 1,000 estimates of this combination here of the, of the slope and the intercept. And of course, our question is, is this, uh, is this uh, slope coefficient uh, positive, right? And you know the answer already. I showed this uh, at the beginning. So this here is our coefficient estimate, the distribution of this. And uh, it's clearly very positive. Here's the T statistics, which are informative under the null that this coefficient is equal to zero. That also looks kind of convincing to me. Now, we get estimates for, for the intercept also, but those, remember, we cannot really disentangle into inefficient and efficient variation. Now, that's, that's the evidence. Um, of course, um, I showed you that the theories imply an interpretation of these coefficients, the marginal effects that we estimate in terms of uh, the adjustment rate. And this adjustment rate is observed in the microprice data, right? So we can go and compute it and compare it to our estimated coefficients which is what this figure does here. So uh, you get uh, the estimation implied the adjustment rate that's down here, and then uh, the adjustment rate that you can straight compute in the microprice data. You see that they are correlated. Uh, it's, a point, uh, it's a 0.6 correlation, uh, but uh, you also see a quite uh, a downward biased regression slope, which is the downward bias that we get in our uh, marginal effect estimates, okay? Now, about the identifying variation, let's take away in our second stage the optimal inflation. Remember, he was the pi star in my original baseline uh, specification, and instead replace it by the inflation rate uh, of the item. Um, and uh, this now is the average inflation rate of the item over the lifetime of the product uh, that, uh, that we look at in this specific case. And you see, if we do this, we take out our identifying variation, we don't get uh, any uh, indication of a significantly positive marginal estimate, okay? So this coefficient is now completely centered at zero, and that's also what the T-statistics tell you, okay? So 
the point is if you relate our measure of price dispersion to actual inflation, which is what the previous literature has done, we don't find anything, okay? Good, now we do a few further robustness checks. Uh, one of them is allowing for nonlinear relative price trends. I guess that's something that's, that's kind of important. Um, I don't wanna spend more time on this, ex uh, except you ask me, especially for one of them. Um, so we also include sales prices and do a couple of other things. Uh, I mean, I think this evidence is actually fairly robust. Now let's let's go back to our little decomposition of surf prices, flex price plus price gap. Um, on the left hand side, we can just compute the cross-sectional dispersion of the surf price, which is what the literature has done before. Now we can do this also in our framework. Uh, in order to speak a little bit about this aggregate decomposition and show what this would be in, uh, in our case, right? So on the left-hand side, this is now the cross-sectional price dispersion of, of the observed relative price in an item Z at a given point in time. So that's a given month. And we can decompose it into a part that we can safely attribute to the flex price dispersion so this is the component of the flex price, the deterministic component. So the intercept and the slope coefficient and the variance of all that in the cross section at a given point in time, plus a residual component. And that residual component again has, has our difficulty here. And that's the identification problem containing flex and sticky price elements, plus something, a term that has all the effect of suboptimal inflation on price distortions. And you see, this thing is now a bit more complicated than what you get in the simple models. It depends on inflation in the item, but also at the entire distribution of optimal inflation rates across products at the given point in time, okay? So it could inflation, actual inflation, in fact, could raise this thing here, but it could also reduce this thing here depending on what the distribution of the optimal inflation rates is. So it's interesting to look at this in the data and that's what we do. So we aggregate across items using expenditure weights and uh, the overall price dispersion, that's the red line. And you see it has over our two decade sample, a massive upward trend, right? Which could be product heterogeneity increasing over time. There's more products, what have you. I mean, lots of reasons for this to occur. And our approach would say that most of this basically all the trend and most of the variation in overall price dispersion is what we would attribute to the identified part of flex price dispersion, okay? So that is not about inflation distorting relative prices. That's something else. Um, now what's left over, that's the red line here and we plot it together with um, the actual inflation rate in the UK. And you see that these, these two time series kind of co-move quite strongly and uh, that is because of price distortions that result from suboptimal inflation here, okay? So that's, that's because of the last term that really we could identify because we could identify this marginal effect. Now, we still have our identification problem, which is about the level of that thing, right? So we can't really tell whether everything we see is inefficient or not, but we can derive lower bounds on price distortions, so, so the, the component of overall price dispersion that is due to suboptimal inflation. And that is a standard deviation of the log relative price uh, about 4%, okay? So that is uh, not overwhelming, but it's also not negligible, okay? So that's, that's basically it. Um, so what did we do? We derived a structural empirical approach to test a main mechanism in, our, in the sticky price models, whether or not suboptimal inflation distorts relative prices. We find at the product level very strong evidence in favor for this. At the aggregate level, we get positive co-variation between price distortions and inflation, which is what a very simple model would predict in which optimal inflation for all the products in fact is equal to zero, right? Uh, so that's consistent. This evidence is consistent with even the simple model. But of course, most of the price dispersion that we observe is not about suboptimal inflation, is really what's going on in the flex price. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you. The discussion.
Right. Um, well, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper and for organizing this great conference year in and year out. I really enjoy being here. Uh, the usual disclaimer applies, so views are my own and not of any other person or institution. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, quickly summarizing the uh, contributions of this paper, and I think Kenyon did a great job presenting it. It's a very long, very dense, very technical paper. It takes time to read it. It takes time, time to check the derivations and everything, but he did a really wonderful job. So I'll be very quick on this, and I'll go very uh, quickly to the comments. So what this paper does, it proposes a novel approach to identify suboptimal price dispersion. Why do we care about optimal versus suboptimal? Is because some of the price dispersion is due to heterogeneity. So maybe there's the same product that you can buy in different stores, but you really like the amenities in store A more than you like it in store B. So you buy that product in store A and you're willing to pay a higher price. There is no problem with this kind of price dispersion because you're just paying for an extra service that you receive. So the type of price dispersion that economists really worry about is the one that, that arrives due to the um, price distortions or price rigidity. And so this is uh, exactly the price dispersion uh, that this paper is identifying. So what I particularly like about this paper is that its empirical strategy is based on standard models of price rigidity. And they're going to unify different types of model. They will look at both time-dependent price rigidity models and state-dependent models. Now, on the empirical side, it documents large price dis distortions and a strong movement with inflation in the UK CPI microdata, which confirms some of the evidence in the literature that, that uh, uh, Hennen told us about earlier. So uh, let me itemize the key elements of this paper. So the key challenge, as I said, is to separate the optimal price dispersion from suboptimal price dispersion. What is their solution? The solution is to exploit a variation in trend inflation across different products. So they're going to go product by product at a very granular level, different items in different stores, estimate the average growth rate of prices for that product, and then use the variation in this growth rate to identify the, uh, the, the suboptimal dispersion. Now, nothing is free in economics that will come with a, at a price that it requires some assumptions on, uh, on the fundamentals in the model. And I'm going to talk about this assumptions uh, later. But before that, let me quickly provide the motivation. This is also related to Francisca's paper. So in our models and different classes of aggregate models, we can uh, approximate the welfare function uh, in the following way. We will have a steady state component that depends on price dispersion, and we will have a business cycle component that depends on the variation of the price dispersion from, uh, from the steady state level. And so here you can see the theta naught in this approximation is a steady state channel and the theta two depends on the variation of inflation over time. It's a business cycle channel. Uh, what is interesting is that this approximation is not specific to a particular time a pricing assumption. It's just based on the, on the utility function of consumers. So whether you have time-dependent price and a state-dependent price, you know, you add search, you're going to arrive to, to, to an equation like that. So price dispersion is a fundamental issue in this type of model. Now, in different pricing models, we would have very tight links between price dispersion and, and inflation. And of course, the easiest model is the Calva model because it gives you a closed form solution. In the Calva model, we can actually write down the equation that will also show up in, in Hanin's paper. In other models, we'll also have this relationship. Uh, it tends to be positive, but it's more difficult to pin down. So let me briefly go over the identification in a nutshell of this paper. So what, what this paper does, it regresses individual prices on, on time trend. It extracts product level time, uh, trend inflation. And then it uses the log deviation on the product's price from the trend to identify the dispersion. Then in the second stage, you just take the variance of the product level uh, um, deviation and you regress it on the deviation of um, 
uh, trend inflation for a given product from the trend inflation in that uh, category of products. And the slope coefficient will give you exactly the marginal effect. Now, there are two key assumptions. So I think I didn't have more, but I'm going to simplify it. One is that you need to have a variation in trend inflations across products within a narrowly defined product category. But at the same time, you need idiosyncratic shocks to be homogeneous across products. So these assumptions need to work together to achieve identification. So my first comment is exactly about that. So I wonder if we can get more evidence, more external validity for these assumptions that in fact, this is the case. For instance, think about two products, like take a category as flat screen TVs, and the product here would be an LG TV versus a Samsung TV. So the identification here assumes that LG TV would be growing at a 3% rate, say, and Samsung TV would be growing at a 4% rate. But at the same time, the shocks are exactly the same. So I wonder if that assumption applies better for services, so if it applies better to goods, and any additional evidence would be welcome. And of course, if we could relax the assumption of homogeneous shocks, that would make the identification even more powerful there. A very quick comment that there could be an additional, some, uh, uh, additional analysis of time variant trends. So this paper uses linear trend and they use quadratic trends as a robustness check, but maybe we can use some filtering techniques to identify the trends uh, non-parametric. My second comment is about distinguishing between time dependent and state dependent pricing models. So the interesting result in this paper that up to some approximation and for a given value of parameter kappa, we're going to get exactly the same slope here. Now, this works for kappas in a range from zero, completely flexible prices, to some kappa uh, bar. Uh, kappa here is the menu cost uh, that is positive. And my question is, how large is that kappa that approximation holds? Usually, the movement of price dispersion inflation is much stronger in the Calva model because there's no selection effect than in the menu cost model, because in menu cost models, the selection effect is strong. And so it's important to know whether this kappa is smaller, kappa bar is small enough, or whether it can be large enough to get this approximation. Um, and I, I, I want to show uh, some result on this from a paper that I particularly like, mostly because I wrote it. Um, in this paper, I, I, I wasn't as good at math as, as Hennon and co-authors, so I just asked computer to solve this for me. I, I didn't do the closed form solution, but I had a model that nests uh, a time-dependent and a state-dependent model given the parameter xi, and so when xi is zero, you get a Calva model, and when xi increases, you get closer to the fixed menu cost model. And I simulated the model and computed the movement of price dispersion and inflation and compared to that in the microdata, and I found that there is much more state dependence uh, in the model, uh, in the data that, that we would observe in the benchmark model. So in, in the paper uh, that Hennon and co-authors write, uh, you would actually have exactly the same movement between the two, but up to some values of parameters and, and some shocks. So I wonder how to reconcile the simulation results and the closed uh, form solution results here. So let me skip this and go straight to my third comment, sorry. So I, th I think that this paper makes a lot of progress on understanding granular level price dispersion, um, but it requires granular level data that doesn't come at high frequencies. And I think practitioners would really appreciate some measure that is available in real time or at least monthly or quarterly. And so I tried to see whether we can learn something from relative price variability from sectoral inflation rates and how strongly income moves uh, with inflation. So this chart plots two series. One is a 12-month headline PC inflation, and the other is the relative price variability, which is standard deviation of sectoral inflation rates. And it measures the correlation between the deviation of inflation from trend, although I was lazy and assumed the 2% trend, which is clearly not the case in the 70s and 80s, but it applies now, and the uh, price dispersion. And the correlation in aggregate data is fairly strong, so that, that there is some reason to look at the aggregate data as well. And if we fix the sample uh, to start from 2012, when the target was announced, so we can be confident that the trend was 2%, the correlation is 0.94. 
So even though we all appreciate very much the, the granular level evidence, this movement is actually strong at the aggregate level in the US uh, price data. And let me briefly show you a recent result uh, obtained uh, from recent work with my uh, colleagues at the Boston Fed, we tried to analyze the recent post-COVID inflation run-up and see whether price dispersion increased uh, when inflation went up. So this is the benchmark distribution of uh, disaggregated inflation rates before the pandemic. As you see, it's very unimodal, bell-shaped, fixed dispersion, but inflation was at 2% or slightly below during that time. As we move to the high inflation environment, not only the distribution moves to the right, it also becomes wider exactly as the models predict. And in 2022, when inflation was particularly high, not only it was wide, but the shape changed completely. It became multimodal as well. So now it starts moving back as trend inflation goes down and it sort of converges back to a unimodal uh, distribution. So there is quite a lot that we can learn from the aggregate distribution of sectoral inflation rates. And with more granular data becoming available, we can also use the decomposition that Hennen and Cather propose to refine these results and also track the distortions at the granular level. So with this, I'll conclude. Uh, this is an excellent paper. It's very timely because the question of the cost of inflation is very important when inflation is high. Uh, there's a lot of uh, progress in this paper, both in theoretical and empirical sites. And I look forward to future work. I think it's more of a research agenda than just one paper. And I think one of the uh, innovations uh, in, the, in this literature could be to relax the assumptions of homogeneous shocks and solve the model for more com uh, complex shock process. Thank you very much. Gustavo, still have five minutes. Any questions from the floor before I give the word back to Henning? Yeah. Hi, Loretta Mester from the Cleveland Fed. So, Henning, I was wondering in your paper, can you say anything about the optimal pi star? Okay, I mean, in case you have further questions, try to be short, okay. Uh, Loretta, thanks for the question. Let, let me start uh, with this one. Um, the optimal pi star is a complicated object in this world, right? Uh, it is uh, an average of all the product level optimal inflation rates, but uh, the difficulty is in the weights. So how you would aggregate them up, and it's not just expenditure weighting, but you want to make sure you weight um, the products with the more sticky prices higher. So that's kind of the, the classical stickiness principle, right? And uh, probably also relative sectoral trends in productivity or what have you going to play a role for these weights. So um, it is there in the in the background, this object, but uh, it's kind of difficult to compute. And we looked a little bit uh, at this in previous work, but uh, in this work, we kind of tried to stay away from this. Yeah. So, uh, Slavik, uh, thanks a lot for your discussion. I, I mean, this was extremely insightful to me. Uh, you raised really a lot of points, and I wonder whether I should uh, talk about all of them. Uh, probably not. <laughs> um, now, you emphasize that we have to adopt uh, assumptions, and yes, I agree, uh, we have to adopt assumptions. I think uh, our assumptions are still a little bit less strong than what you often find in the field. So often people in the field assume uh, random walk shocks. Um, so the flex price follows random walk uh, idiosyncratic shocks. And uh, I think that is really a knife edge, knife edge assumption. And we show in the paper that if you adopt that assumption, in fact, you can go and identify the price gap distribution. Right. That's also what uh, other work uh, shows. But if you do not ad uh, adopt this assumption, you cannot make this link. And uh, that's why we think that the stochastic process, uh, which is stationary, is in fact a good assumption to make because it's a more general assumption and it makes our life harder. Now, having said this, uh, we do have to assume that in a given item, all the idiosyncratic uh, shock processes are the same across products. And we have one robustness check. Uh, now, why does this matter? Well, it implies that the constant uh, that we get in the second stage 
is the same for all the products in the item. Okay. Now we have looked at a robustness check where we get away, uh, we, where we can do away with this assumption, and it turns out to work. Right. So empirically, we could uh, abandon this assumption, and uh, I agree with you. I think that's an, a very important robustness check. Now. Um, Linear trends, I mean, you may think that's a bit of a crazy assumption. You want to go more uh, fancy, less parametric. In the theory, we start from a quadratic uh, loss function for the firm. So I feel it's, uh, um, that suggests you want to have a linear trend in, uh, in the flex price. Um, and also the effect of inflation on prices. So price erosion turns out to be log linear, right? So in that sense, I think uh, the linear trend is a good thing. But I mean, uh, I understand the point and uh, we do robustness checks uh, and I think uh, they pass. <laughs> now you point out that uh, time and state dependent pricing models have different implications for this marginal effect and uh, say that the marginal effect should be considerably larger for the state dependent pricing, pricing models than the time dependent pricing models. Well, I guess my answer here is a bit hands off. Uh, fine, <laughs> you know we don't want to take a stand. Uh, what uh, which of the two models have generated the data, and uh, both is fine with us. Uh, now you could push us and go further uh, to a higher order approximation of our second stage in order to be a bit more decisive here. But I think uh, at the current state, I would like to stay away from this. Um, Relative price variability and sectoral inflation rates. I have difficulty seeing how this measure maps into the price dispersion measure that we want to look at from the theory's point of view, right? And I understand that there's a practical practical interest to have something like this. I think that's a separate type of analysis to see how that kind of easily available measure is related to really the theory consistent measure and. Uh, uh, yeah, that could be an interesting type of analysis. Pandemic and uh, uh, price dispersion, a super exciting topic. Uh, we haven't had time to do it. Uh, the paper is not only uh, not so easy to read, it was also not so easy to write, uh, which took us a little bit of time. <laughs> and uh, I guess I, I stop here uh, in case there are no further questions. On this light or maybe heavy note, depending on the eye of the beholder, whether that's light or heavy. So I invite you to the poster session and then lunch. Thank you very much.